I greet you, Sita Meldoret, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Buana asifiwe. Some of you are not greeting me. Buana asifiwe. I am so, so, so happy to be here this morning. Um, Pastor Buire invited me some weeks back for me to be here. And I thought it was such an honor, especially in the, from the national calendar. And that on Tuesday we'll be casting votes and that Eldoret is a hot spot. I, I felt an honor and yet a responsibility that was being put on me. So I pray that as I deliver the word of God that it will come to you expressly. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 3 said, The word of the Lord came to me expressly, without detouring, without you thinking it was for somebody else, that it will come to you expressly. And so I want to say a big thank you to Reverend Buire, together with your team. I'm happy to see you, Pastor Petronila, together with uh, my village mate. Uh, we have some uh, knowledge there. I'm glad to connect with you again after some time. Um, I would like to share on the journey of faith of Peter. The journey of faith of Peter. And around that, I'll be at the back of your mind, we'll be looking at how we can persist in prayer until we become victorious. How we can persist in prayer until we become victorious. So that we do not give up because of the failures or the mistakes or the potholes that we find ourselves in and feel like we have, we have failed or we are not worthy to continue. We persist in prayer. And so I would like to use just one individual, walk the life, the, his life, and God willing, you will get something for yourself. I appreciate the fact that we have children in the house and uh, we have grandparents in the house, this is going to cut across that spectrum so that wherever you are in your spiritual walk, in your search for God, in your chronological something, that the life of Peter, the journey of faith of Peter this morning would encourage you to continue. Let me also say this. That yes, at the end of the service, we'll pray for the nation, for the elections that are coming, that peace is our portion. But really, really, we have prayed. And because God is not deaf, because God never goes on holiday so that his office is closed, we know that he has taken note of our cries, of our plead, pleas to him. And so I would like, using one more time, the journey of Peter, I would like to encourage us that, yes, that is what is the going on out there, but where are you in your life? What's your journey like? We can be thinking about who will be the governor. We can be thinking about who will be who, where, when. But really, God is interested in you because you are the one who is here. That other person, we may not even meet them. And when we meet them, we can't tell them about a sermon we had three weeks ago. It's about you, that God wants to refocus you. So that, yes, you are in Kenya, yes, you are in Uasingishu, yes, you are in Eldoret, but where are you in terms of your journey with your God? Let's pray one more time. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we submit to the authority of your word that, Lord, you have gathered here, us here as your saints, as your children, as your witnesses in this nation, in this county, and in this town. Lord, I pray that as your word goes forth, it will go forth with conviction, take away side shows, and cause us to focus on you. When you ask the disciples, who do people say that I am? They went on to say the other and the other and the other. 
but you zeroed in on them and you said, what do you say that I am? And this morning I pray that seated before me, your people, they'll be able to say, my journey with Jesus is this. And they'll be very specific and definite. We thank you, Father, because of your faithfulness. This is my prayer to you because I ask it in Jesus' name. And the saints said, amen. And the saints said, louder. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bishop Adoyo was, uh, uh, is busy this morning praying somewhere at KICC in Nairobi. He blessed me to be here. And because I like to operate under authority, I didn't just leave him sleeping and say, let me go, uh, I'm going to do... No, he blessed me. And every time, every time I go to speak, I tell him, my husband, put your hand on me and I bend because I submit to that um, authority. And I know, therefore, whatever I'm saying is blessed and it will come with the anointing that it deserves. I want to begin by, I'm going, I'm going to use a lot of uh, references a lot of references, and it's good for us. I know it's going to ask that it be portrayed there, but uh, it's also good to have your Bible so that you are able to, to geography yourself uh, through the scriptures quickly. It will all be in the New Testament, yes, but it's good to just be able to go through these pages. Sometimes you say, let's read Titus, and somebody is busy in the beginning in the content and is looking for Titus. So by the time they find it, by the time they go to where it is, by the time they find the chapter and the verse, the person has read and has finished and has moved to the next. But let me just warn you that I'm going to use a lot of references so that we can see this journey because the journey has many marks, many twists, and many turns of this man. When do we first meet the gentleman by the name Simon Peter? We meet him first in the book of John, chapter number one, and verse 40 to 42. I would like to read um, that, the book of John, chapter one, and verse 40 to 42. Now, I, I know it's being portrayed, like I said, but I'm not hearing pages turning. Let's hear them turning, please. I'm keen on that. I'm keen on that. Looking at the book of John, chapter 1 and verse 40, 41 and 42, the Bible says this, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he, Andrew, brought him, Peter, to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated rock or stone. Praise the name of the Lord. An ordinary finding, an ordinary brother finds somebody or meets somebody that he thinks is worth his brother meeting. And Andrew goes and tells his brother Peter and he says, let's go and meet. I found somebody. I found he is the Messiah. Come. And indeed, the two brothers walk up to Jesus, and Jesus looks not at Andrew, who has brought the brother, but looks at Peter himself and says, yes, you are the Peter, the son of Jonah, and on you, you are Cephas, also the rock or the stone. Already, Jesus identified something in Peter right from the beginning. He looked at him the first time to meet and he looked and saw there is something here. There's something solid. There's something good. And I would like to say to every last one of you, regardless of what age you are, whether you are seven years old or you are 47 years old or you are 67 years old, it doesn't matter. The Bible, the word is saying that God in his own way, he is looking at you right now on this seventh day of August. 2022, and he's seeing a person of resource, a person of use, 
a person of, that can contribute of value. And I would like to encourage someone if you are there and you are feeling discouraged because you have come just like Peter came. Just like Peter came to Jesus, you have come. And he's saying, you are so-and-so, so-and-so's wife or so-and-so's husband or so-and-so's son or so-and-so. And on you are strong. I want to build my church on you. I want to encourage someone that in this season, while people are very passionate about political pursuits, things that are perishable and will have an end, I pray God that this morning you may turn your eyes away from that and connect with this man, the man Simon Peter. So a very normal, ordinary encounter of this man, Peter, with the master, the Lord Jesus Christ. The next time we see him, we, I would like to use the verse of uh, um, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, a familiar verse that we know. It's, it, Jesus says that two, Simon Peter, together with his brother again, came and Jesus told them, you shall become fishers of men. You shall stop being fishers of fish and become fishers of men. Jesus goes a step further, not just knowing, not just being introduced to them. Another time, soon after that, he again meets the two brothers and he says, I will make you fishers of men. I liked what Pastor Patronilla said. She said she's out, her passion is to help people become fishers of men. People go out and make disciples, train. And I think we are failing a lot on that. We are keeping salvation and the knowledge of Christ with ourselves and not passing it on. And yet that is what Jesus, the final command that Jesus gave us. He said, go and make disciples. And so Jesus is already enlisting. He's already counting on this brother, on these two brothers. But his eyes are more on the newer brother, Simon Peter. I will make you fishers of men. Luke chapter 6, come with me there. Luke chapter number 6 and reading verse 12. The Bible says this, Luke 6 and verse number 12, we are looking at the journey of faith of Peter. And around that, I want us to see that there was a persistence in prayer for him and by him. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 12, the Bible says this, Now it came to pass in those days that he, Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. 13, And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Verse 14, guess what? What is their number one? Simon, whom he also named Peter, and then the rest. And then the brother comes, and then the rest. I want you to see something that Jesus had seen in this man. So that the, the reason why he spent time in prayer a whole night, I don't know that he was praying all night as such as such but that that whole night he dedicated it to seek God. Maybe he would doze off a bit and wake up and so on, but it was uh, focusing on making a choice on who, the, on who the disciples would be. And maybe some of us may not know this, but that Jesus did not just have 12 disciples. Actually, the scriptures say, you know that disciple is follower, those who are following Jesus. And at some point, Jesus had very many disciples, we are told, 500. At another point, we are told he had 72. At another point, he had 70. In other words, he had many people who are following him consistently, not those who just come and go and are sorted and they go, no, no. Those who are committed to him, following him again and again. He had many at some point. But a time came when he needed a smaller group that he could impact, that he could uh, uh, train, that he could input himself in them. And this is how it came about, that he took time to say, Lord God Almighty, Father, show me out of these many, 
I want 12. Can you select them for me? He took time in prayer a whole night. Then the following day, as it says there, he got uh, to the rest of the disciples and he picked 12 of them and the story you know. But I want you to note number one on the list is Simon Peter. Something that he had seen, he didn't want to lose that. He didn't want to give it away. He didn't want to overlook it. He looked and pointed out in listing all the disciples, he went, he began with Peter. Come with me to John 6. That was Luke 6. So let's go to John 6. We'll rotate in this. We'll also go to Acts. We'll also go to his letter, the letter of uh, Peter later on. I pray God that I'll be able to manage this in the time that is given. But I want, I want the life of Peter to really speak to us and to get us to move forward and not to stagnate because of difficulties. John chapter 6 and verse number, reading from verse 66. It's, I like that verse, not that I like it, but it's worth remembering this verse because it's 666. Chapter 6, and verse 66, it says this. When Jesus began to talk tough things about following him, I'm saying, when Jesus began to talk tough things about people who are following him and they thought it was just easy, bread being multiplied. Actually, this one, bread had just been multiplied and fish had a sumptuous meal. He began, after that, he began telling them about the kingdom of God. It's not just food. It's not just following. It's not just healing. They are greater things. And when that happened, the Bible says this in John chapter 6 and verse number 66. It says, from that time, the time of the hard saying, difficult saying, from that time, many of his disciples, remember I told you there were more than 12, Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Please, I have to repeat that verse. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. 67, then Jesus said to the 12, remember, are you understanding now what I'm saying? The 12 are the, the prayed disciples. The others are those other ones. So he said to the 12, do you also want to go away? 68, guess what? Who, who speaks? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He was beginning, Peter was beginning to understand that even if it's tough, even if they are difficult sayings, we are here to stay. I needed an amen there. That even when things are going difficult, becoming difficult, becoming rough, I'm not quitting. I want to speak to someone this morning saying things are not easy. And you have a reason to say, where is my God? I want you to know and have the mentality, the mindset of Peter to say you, Lord Jesus, you have words of eternal life. Where can we go? Where can we go? Yes, we are in a season where we are being promised. We are being promised money. We are being promised settle, being settled in our land issues. We are being promised politically. But those we can go, we can't, they can't guarantee and we can't be guaranteed of getting. But you know, when you stick with Jesus, he takes care of you. So Peter declares a profound statement and says, Lord, you have words of eternal life. So while people are quitting on the church, while people are saying, ah, I tried salvation, it didn't work. Last Saturday, not yesterday, eight days ago, I had a conference of, uh, called Christian Women of Kenya. We have a branch here in, uh, in Eldoret. But we are having a national uh, conference in, uh, in Nairobi. And at the end of the conference, there was an Askari, a, a soldier at the gate, a lady and a man. And uh, well, now when everybody had gone and I was the last one to leave, I thought I need to talk to this lady about salvation. 
Because it's very sad that somebody would stand at the church at a conference. People know the Lord, they go to heaven and they are left. So I talked to her. And she told me, I don't go to church. I said, what? You don't go to church? She said, no. Then I said, I think you need Jesus yesterday. She said, um, na iyo, nime, nime okoka, nime okoka, safari nyingi, I don't want. You know, it could be there are those who are dismissing salvation or even church going because it has not worked for them. But I've been sent to the people that are seated in front of me. Say the journey of Peter was one of determination, of saying that I may fail, I may not understand, I may look like I'm crude, but I'm not giving up. I know there is something about, and for us not to be frustrated with the political atmosphere, we have to be persuaded in our spirits about our stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is him that will steady you. It's him that will take away the frustration or the empty promises that you are banking on to have and it hasn't come through. It's only Christ who will say, it is well. It is well. I will take you through this moment. And so many disciples fell off. 66. 67, Jesus asks, says so, you 12 also, are you going to go? And the one of them, the one that we are zeroing in, says where can we go? You have words of eternal life. May that come to pass for you. May that come to pass for you. After this, this was after the feeding of the 5,000 when this question, come with me to Matthew 14. Let's see this man again. He's... Uh, like a, a, a toddler in the faith. He's walking, he's believing some and uh, messing up in others. But in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, he again dares Jesus. He tells Jesus, let me see if it works. Are you with me? Are you with me? He's saying, yes, I see you, but does it really work for others, for me? In Matthew 14, 28 and 29, Matthew 14, 28 and 29. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he, Jesus, said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and, began, and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Praise the name of the Lord. Yes, his faith failed when he had stepped in the water. As in he looked at the, the waves and he saw death is right at his doorstep. But at least one credit that we give him is that out of the 12, he's the only one who said, let me see if it works. Let me step in and see if it works. And you know, you are in that family, you are in that office, and you are the only one that says, I will trust God for this family. I'll trust God for this family. And let me say this, families, I don't know what is happening about families, but families are in bad shape. My friend, families are in bad shape. Siblings not talking to the other. Parents, children not talking. Parents splitting apart. Families are in bad shape. And I've been sent to let you know that you are the man that God is trusting, is looking to, that you may say, let me try it. Let me try it on behalf of my family. Let me trust Jesus for the remedy of this family, of this marriage, of these children. God is looking to you. As you are looking to him, he's looking to you. And you are saying, not me. You are saying, maybe somebody else. I've tried this so many times. Here was this man. Small by small, his journey of faith with the ups and downs. But each time he was better off than he was previously. And this is a message that I bring to us this morning. That you may take God who does not frustrate, who does not fail who does not give you complete victory all at once. You must learn. You must journey with him. You must walk with him. 
until you will become a testimony yourself. My friend, oh, I need an amen from far over there. That until you become a testimony yourself, that people will look at you and say that God of that mama there, that God of that gentleman there, that God is the God that I want. Praise the name of the Lord. Come back with me to the book of Luke, chapter number nine. We are looking at this man, the journey of Peter and the power of prayer that worked him into the office, into the place, into the calling that God had made him, had called him to be. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 18 to 20, Luke 9, 18 to 20, the Bible says this, and it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples, the 12 now, joined him and he asked them saying, who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, some Elijah, some uh, the old prophet reason, 20. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Look at that. Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. You are the Christ, the son of God. Peter was beginning to understand the person that had, had invited him to come and walk with him. He was now able to articulate that this is not just Joseph's son. This is not just Judah's brother or James' brother. This is not just Mary's son. This is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, able to define God. I want you to know in this journey, your journey, on this journey, using the life of Peter, God wants you to articulate who Jesus is to others. Somebody say amen that you'll be able with confidence to declare and say, I know Jesus Christ saves people, men and women like me. On the flight, as I was coming this morning, I, I, I always, I think a lot of you know that, I always walk in my handbag with the four spiritual laws. I don't know if you know that little book, it's about eight pages. Four spiritual laws. Uh, written by Life Ministry. I always have it because if I don't have time to explain salvation, at least I say I'm born again. Please read this. It will help you. So I sat next to this young man and I had my first spiritual law ready because it's a short flight. I said, uh, I don't want to look like I'm just giving it at the last end. So I began with it and the man told me I'm a Muslim. I said, oh, Muslims don't read. I said, uh, he said, yeah, they read, but spiritual things I stay away from. I told him, but you know what? You need to know more about the spiritual things. He didn't give me a, an opportunity to witness as such, but at least I told him of my salvation in Christ Jesus. I'm saying this was Peter able to define who Jesus is. He's getting there slowly by slowly. In the same chapter, in cha verse number 28, Luke chapter 9 and verse 28, the Bible says this, Still about the man Peter. Says now, it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he, Jesus, took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to do what? I'm asking you to do what? As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Verse 32, see that? But Peter and those, who, and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw the glory and the two men who stood with him. Verse 33, then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here and let us make three and he goes on to suggest. The point I'm saying here is again, Jesus wants Peter to understand who he is, who Jesus is. Not, to, uh, not Peter to understand himself, no. For Peter to understand who Jesus is. And he again separates him 
from the rest of the 12. He leaves nine and takes three of them. And he takes them up the mountain, the scriptures tell us. And there he begins to pray. He begins to tell them this leadership, this position that you are in is not one of, uh, of the physical, one of the muscle. It's one where you must communicate, connect with the Lord your God. So he goes with them on the mountain, Jesus, and he actually begins to set the pace. The Bible says, as he prayed, hallelujah. I'm saying, as he prayed, while he prayed, the Bible says his face changed. The Bible says his very garments changed as well. And then he was uh, accompanied by two others. A whole, a whole very amazing spectacle for them to see. It was like Jesus was saying, come with me. I know not too long ago you defined me as Proverbs 18 and 19. You defined who I am. But I want you to see more. My dear friends, Sitam of Eldoret, God is saying I have so much I would like to show you, to reveal myself to you. To reveal myself, I'll take care of you. I will do what you cannot imagine. Just come with me. Be close to me. Walk with me. Come along with me. Hear me. Obey me. And you will see great, how great and who I am. So he says, come with me up the mountain. This time, not the twelve of you, just the three of you. And of the three, it is the number one, Peter, who is made to see. It says, and Peter and the other two. It's like the other two now are not the focus. It is Peter who is the focus. He realizes and says, this is a glory I've never seen. It's a wonder I've never seen. And he says, and he sees two others. And by inspiration, he realizes these are the great man, Moses, the lawgiver, and the great prophet, Elijah. What a sight. God is revealing himself. And you know what? That God who revealed himself to Peter in his time, is still our God, the same one that Peter dealt was dealing with, that was bringing the glory of Jesus to Peter. That God is still wanting to show, demonstrate his glory over your life. He is not a God of partiality, the Bible says. He is not a God of favoritism. He wants to reveal himself in this season. Why? I'm saying we need to refocus. Because sometimes when you're close to these political leaders, there is a dignity, there is a pride, there is a way even you walk because you are connected to the who and who. But let me tell you, those people have their own limits. Let's not put our eyes and our eggs all there. I'm saying there is one, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus said there is one greater than Solomon. There is one greater than Jonah. There is one greater, the master, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was telling Peter, he was saying, I'm greater than you are imagining. I can do greater things than you are thinking. I have a glory that you cannot even see. Come with me on the mountain and I will show you. And sure enough, the man, I will show you at the end of his life what he had to say about that mountain. Experience. Come with me to chapter 22 in the same book. Chapter 22 and verse 31. We are looking at the journey of Peter until he became Saint Peter, a great stalwart in the faith. We are looking at Luke chapter 22 and verse 31 and 32. The Bible says this. The Bible says this in verse 31. And if you are there, please say amen. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. Allow me to read it again. Because we want, I would like us to hear. As the word of God goes you know, sound, you hear it, should land in some soft soil, good soil. Allow me to read it again. And the Lord said, Simon, 
Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Praise the name of the Lord. Let me say this. Not knowing what lay ahead of him, Peter. Not knowing the problems that lay ahead of him. The master already took over the situation of, Paul, of Peter. And he says, I have prayed for you. Let me say this, my friends. The enemy, Satan, always has a bad agenda, agenda against you. But thank God, Jesus Christ prays for you. But let me say this too, that make sure, have somebody that prays for you. Ah, you're missing it. I'm saying, have somebody that prays for you. Have a group of people that prays for you. Don't say, oh, Mama Adoyo, you, you know you, you travel so much, so you need people to pray for you. No, no, no. All of us, all of us, you need someone to be praying for you. Not a prayer partner, I'm not talking about a prayer partner where you meet to pray together, no. Just somebody whom will always pray for you. They hear, they'll wake up, they will know something and they'll pray for you. Yesterday afternoon, I was meeting with the pastor's wives from Langata. Uh, pastors to, wives to pastors who live in Langata or minister in Langata. A whole lot of women there were meeting in Langata at one of their homes. And I told them about my coming here this morning. And uh, I was just giving them as an information and, of course, for prayer, yes. But the leader of that group told all of them, there were about uh, 14 women there, uh, told them and said, can we just make it our point to be praying for Mama? When we remember, when she tells us, and even when she doesn't tell us, let's just be praying for her. There's also another team. It's called Standing in the Gap. Another group that pray for me. So when I'm here like this, there's somebody, somebody somewhere that is praying for me. The Bible says here, Jesus, realizing the peril that was facing Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, I have prayed for you. Why? Because the enemy was coming full force against you, but I've prayed for you and that your faith may not fail. Can I ask someone, may your faith not fail? May you not fail the Lord God in this situation. May you not fail God in this season. May the, the power of prayer from somewhere come to you and cause you to stand and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know what could have happened to Peter if he hadn't been prayed for by Jesus Christ. Maybe he would have committed suicide like Judas. Maybe he would have backslidden never to show up again. Maybe, maybe. But the Bible says... Jesus prayed for him that his faith would not fail. And then it goes on. He, he tells him, Jesus tells Peter what Peter doesn't even know. He says, when you have failed that way and you come back, strengthen the church. He didn't know he would fail. But Jesus who sees tomorrow, he says, when that pit hall, pitfall that you will have fallen in, when you come out, remember to strengthen the church. Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord is interested that somebody be praying for you. The other side of that coin is make sure you pray for somebody. Make sure you pray for somebody, especially family members. Make sure you pray passionately because the enemy may be wanting to scatter, but you, because you are there. I'm saying, but you, because you are the faith pillar that is there. May you pray for somebody that somebody's faith may not fail. Somebody say a good amen. Somebody say a better amen. amen. And uh, I think time will fail me, so I will just uh, move uh, real fast on this. In the same chapter, chapter 22, and from verse 39 up till 46, we know that as the prayer in the garden of Gethsemane. We know that. I wish I would have loved to use the Matthew uh, version, but because of time, let's just stick there. When Jesus is praying in the garden and he goes with the disciples and he separates the three again. He says, come and see. So he goes with the 12, he leaves the nine there. He says, come you three, he comes with the three and then he goes on his own here. 
and he comes on the three and he finds they are sleeping. And he goes and prays and he comes. In Matthew it says, when he comes a second time and finds the three, he doesn't bother with the three, he bothers with the one. And he says, Peter, why are you asleep? Actually he says, oh, Peter, why are you asleep? You know what? Please, let's drop the group mentality. Ah, oh, I like that. I like it. It came without my thinking. Yeah. Let's drop the group mentality and begin to zero in with our God on an individual at your level. Because God will sometimes, friends, discourage you. You can, like sometimes I say, let's pray for or fast for three days. Somebody says, oh, maybe we make it two. You see? When you share, when it's group, there is always a way of adjusting what maybe God showed you. Like that conference I told you last week, it's uh, somewhere in Mwiki, those of you that know Nairobi, and Mwiki is uh, really in the Bundus kind of, of Nairobi. And we have a space there, so we, have, uh, we were meeting in that space uh, in tents. And I, the Lord spoke to me, said, you are the head of this, you are the chair lady, and you're going to be sleeping there. People will be, go to the hotel, people will go there, you will sleep in that house that doesn't even have a bed or something, you'll go there. And I thought if I share with the committee, they'll say, hey, mama, you can't sleep there, you'll get pneumonia, you'll get sick, you'll do what? So I just kept quiet, everybody was making arrangements and, oh uh, yeah, the transport and all that. But I slept there two nights and I didn't get sick. You know, sometimes... The group mentality can detour you. Are you hearing? The group mentality, when God speaks to you, just pursue it. Follow it through. So Jesus looks at Peter, says, why are you asleep? And because of that, you know, because they didn't pray, you know what happened to them? When it came to push and show, yeah, they, it's Peter. In John, uh, we won't go there this time because I'm realizing my time is up. In John chapter 18, and verse number 10. Other gospels, they say one of them, one of the disciples pulled out a sword and cut whose ear? The servant's ear. Because they hadn't prayed enough, they could only trust their muscle. Ah, uh, sit up. Sit, where are you, pastor? They are not hearing. Sit up, Eldoret. I'm saying because they didn't know their God on a personal level, they were in a group syndrome. They were in a group drive. They realize what don't, we don't have any other thing but this sword. And guess what John 18.10 says? It was actually Peter. He said, Nipatie iyo. And off the ear came. My friend, Jesus looked at him and said, we don't fight it this way. We don't do things this way. My friends, it's a journey of faith. You are making blunders. You made blunders this week. You talked wickedly about the political something and you feel good, bad about it. You don't even want to repeat. And you're feeling yourself like this salvation doesn't, no, no, no. Just keep going. Keep going. In that uh, Luke chapter, I, I, I just have to tell you this one. Luke chapter 22, that same chapter where we are still. I skipped it, but uh, let me just tell you. In verse number 28, Luke 22, and verse 28 and 29, 28 in particular, you know, Jesus told his disciples, the 12, he told them, you are the ones who have continued with me. Ah, uh, do I have a church before me? Do I have a church before me? I'm saying Jesus looked at his disciples, the 12, and he told them, you are the ones who have continued with me. Jesus is looking for men, women, wives, Mothers, fathers, who will continue, who will keep it up, who will stick no matter what is happening. And that's why I believe God sent me here for a reason. To tell the people of Wasingishi to say, we must hold on to Jesus. Anything else will fail, but Jesus will not fail. We must play the game his way, the way of Christ, not chopping off, not the panga way, not the bad language way, the way of peace. Peter wanted the way of war. If they have come with clubs, even as we have clubs, even as we have swords, 
There have come many more, but even us, we are with the master himself, we will win the battle. Doesn't work that way. Let me tell you, God is looking for men and women in this city that will exude the fragrance of peace, the fragrance of prayer, the fragrance of an, an, the unseen power, the unseen hand of God in the matters, in the affairs of our nation. You know, the Bible says, put not your trust in a prince because when the prince dies, there dies his promises for you. But our prince, hallelujah, our prince, the Lord Jesus, a prince of peace, lives and lives forevermore. Praise the name of the Lord. In verse 54, looking at Luke 22, we are still there. Luke 22, verse 54 up to 62, gives us the, the, the denial of Peter. He has followed, you know, I'm, I'm showing you it's a journey. He has followed, he's close, yes, he has actually now is in the inner circle, but he denies Jesus. Verse 62 says, and he went out and he wept bitterly. He wept, he said, how? I saw his glory. I've seen him, I, I walked on water. I know he's different. But when I was faced by this servant girl, by this other guy, I said, I don't know him. I don't know. says he wept. Bitterly. God is looking for people who will weep bitterly. Not just feel sorry, but wept bitterly. I have to skip some of these um, verses. But let me just narrate because I, I think they will add something. Let me see what I can do. Um, in John 21, just write them. Just, I think we'll just have to write them. In John 21, the same Peter, in John 21, verse 1 and following, verse 2 actually, verse 2 and 3, we see Peter telling six other disciples out of the 12, now they are 11 anyway, now they are 11, and out of those he tells six others. He tells them, I'm going back fishing. In other words, I'm going to what I used to do, this Jesus business I don't want. I'm going back. You know what? Six, half of the total of 12, they say even us. Even us, we are following you. And the Bible says he went, Peter went with them and the whole night, they got what? Nothing. My friend, when you desert the way of God, you are, going, you are the one to be frustrated. You are the one who will lose. And Jesus comes round. Jesus comes round and tells them, come back, tells Peter, not them, Peter. Says, take care of my sheep. Remember that prayer in chapter 22, 31 and 32? I've prayed for you and when you come back, strengthen the church. He tells, Jesus tells Peter, strengthen the sheep, feed the sheep, take care of the sheep. Let's skip and go to Acts 1.15. I'll just use one. There were a number of them. But let me just use one. Uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. The Bible says this. Come quickly with me. I'll try. I'll try to rush. Uh, it says, and in those days, Peter stood up. Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up. Now Jesus is absent. Oh. Jesus has gone away. Oh. It's like it's now in his hands. You fail it, you sink it, or you rise. Thanks be to God, my friends. The Bible says Peter stood up. He realized this is a space that my master has left for me. He stood up. And at the end of his life, in 2 Peter, come with me, because I want to be invited next time by the man of God. Otherwise, he'll say in that one, is off my list because she doesn't honor time. She doesn't respect time. I'm doing my best, man of God. Okay, 2 Peter 5, and this is my last verse. 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm sorry. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 16, 17. The Bible says this. Peter, an old man now, seasoned, 
understood what ministry is, what the call of God is, what salvation. Let's not use call unless you think I'm talking about pastor. Salvation. He says this, writing. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Remember chapter 9, verse 28 on the mountain? But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord is saying he has business with your life. The Lord is saying it may look a long journey. The Lord is saying it may look like you are not making it, you are not understanding. But finally, finally, there is a great work that he wants to accomplish. That when you have returned, when you are strong, when you have come out of that difficult patch that you are in right now, that you will stand and encourage others. Please rise up on your feet. Please rise up on your feet right now. I'll be real quick. Rise on your feet. I want to say a prayer as I conclude. I want to say a prayer over your lives. I want to say a prayer that will bring a transformation in your life and in your situation. Those pastors' wives, last night, last evening, last afternoon, when they were praying for me about this ministry. One of them was led to say, Father, accompany Mama Adoyo with signs and wonders. I didn't ask for it. I wasn't expecting. I was just set to preach about that. But they, uh, that landed in my spirit. Say, accompany Mama Adoyo after the word with signs and wonders. And I feel like there are people here with bodily ailments and maybe other concerns and issues in your life. But bodily ailments stood out for me uh, in my spirit as that word landed in my spirit. That God wants to heal right now as he healed in the time of that Peter was learning from Jesus. And later on, we know in chapter 3 of Acts how he raised the lame man. Healing took place. The Lord was putting in my spirit as I say this prayer that is going to release. I'm saying, God is saying it's going to release the grace of healing over somebody whose body has been hurting them. And he told me, a man, not a man, men that are struggling with prostate, because I know that's a condition only for men who are struggling. The Lord is going, he said, I will bring deliverance with me. I will bring deliverance with me. Hallelujah. 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 He's releasing his grace of healing right now. Please raise your hands above your head. Raise your hands as you submit to him. He's releasing his power of healing just as he did for Peter and Peter picked it up and he began to heal the way his master Jesus would heal. Oh, he wants to do that just now. Believe with me. Believe him. The Jesus of Peter is your Jesus. Father, Father, Hallelujah, Hallelujah.